One of the most asked questions in all of the world is the question, why am I here? Someone said one time that, uh, I, heard, I heard someone say that uh, over the past 10 years that that's probably the most Googled question uh, in the Google search engine is the question, why am I here? I don't know how, you, how they compute all of that and I don't know how they figure it out, but I know that many people uh, ask me, continually all the time what's my purpose why am i here what am i what am i doing here uh, what's god have for me and i think the most important thing that you can know in your life is what your assignment is and what your purpose is because how many of you understand this god didn't wait for you to be born and then go looking for something for you to do the reason you were born is because there was something that needed to be done and god saw that you could fulfill the purpose and and you were born and you were placed here with a purpose. Every, every person in this room this morning has a ministry. Every single person that's sitting under the sound of my voice has a ministry. Not everybody is called to preach. Not everybody is called to a pulpit. Not everybody is called to a public speaking ministry. But everybody in here is called to a ministry. I've been reading a book of late, and, and uh, uh, the, the guy that wrote this book, his name is Ed Silvoso, and, and in his book entitled Ecclesia, Ed Silvoso asked the question, he said, could it be that we have confined to four walls once a week what was meant to be a 24-7 people movement out in the marketplace transforming our cities and nation?" And could it be that we have restricted ministry to professionally trained specialists instead of ministry being the work of all saints? Do you understand that everybody in here has a job to do? And there's not one job that is more important than another job. Everybody has something that God intended for you to do. Everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a reason. Everybody has a plan that, that is supposed to be fulfilled. Jesus is the one that changed the entire world by fulfilling the purpose and the assignment that was given to Him. And before He was crucified, Jesus prayed for those who were His followers and He prayed this prayer in John. And he said, Father, John chapter 17, he said, Father, I'm not asking you to take these people out of the world, but Father, you sent me into the world with a mission, and I'm sending them into this world with a mission. I was the one who changed the world by completing the assignment that you gave to me, and now they are the ones who will change their world by completing the assignment that you have purpose for them. Everybody in this room has a purpose, and you will not be complete until you're assigned is complete and you say well all of that is is good Larry and you know but but I don't know what my assignment is well if you don't know what your assignment is you're in a good place today because I've been sent to help you understand what your assignment is a couple of Wednesday nights back we we closed out a series on the Beatitudes and and the Beatitudes were the beginning portion of Jesus sermon on the mount and it was in this sermon that Jesus set out the agenda for a brand new kingdom that he had been sent here to establish and and after Jesus goes through laying out the framework for the kingdom in the first eight verses of Matthew 5 he then goes on to clarify for his followers exactly what their purpose and exactly what what their position is as a part of this new kingdom. And that's where I want to take my text from this morning. So if you have your Bibles and want to follow me, you can. Matthew chapter 5, it's probably not going to read like yours because I'm going to read from the message version today. And, and I want to read Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 through 16. And it reads like this. It says, let me tell you why you're here. I told you I was going to help you today. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness, and you're going to end up in the garbage. Matthew 14. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. 
Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. And everybody say amen. Amen. I want to tell those of you that are gathered here today that if something is going to happen in the city of Denison for the kingdom of God, then we are the ones. We are the ones. If it's going to happen in Grayson County, in Fannin County, in Cook County, in Bryan County, or in the Texoma region, then we are the ones through which the change and the transformation is going to come. It won't be anybody else. It's up to you and it's up to me. I preached on this past Thursday night at a conference in Lawton, Oklahoma that that what the church needs in 2017 is a baptism of responsibility. And I would like to be able to, to, to add to that and to tell you that unless the church is willing to take a sense of ownership for the world that we're living in, then we need to stop complaining about the devil taking territory. Because the truth is, he's only taking what we're giving him as a result of refusing to take ownership and accept that we have a responsibility to the world we live in and the people that we live around. The enemy can't take anything that we don't give him. And the only reason he's gaining ground is because we're being quiet. The only reason that he gains territory, as I stood last uh, uh, Sunday morning, as I stood in service, and, and I began to watch as they worshipped on, on this past Sunday morning, as they worshipped there in Uganda. Let me tell you something. The music got to going, and, and uh, man, listen. <clears throat> We're talking about people that have nothing. The average salary of the person that we ministered to this past week, the average salary is $70 per month. Per month. That's about 250,000 Ugandan shillings. And one of the men we talked to told us that out of 250,000 shillings, $70 a month, it takes 100,000 shillings for him to pay for his daughters to go to school because if you don't pay, you can't go to school in Uganda. So 100,000 it costs for him to his, for his daughter to go to school. He pays 80,000 shillings for rent every month. He pays 50,000 shillings for food every month, which leaves him with 20,000 shillings, which is approximately $6 for the month. And yet these people are the most joyful people that I've ever met in my life. They have absolutely nothing. Pastor James' church is built next to a dump. A trash dump. The people directly across the street from his church have no running water. They have no electricity. 10% of the church is infected with HIV. And y'all not talking to me today. And yet when they come in the house of God, they come in and they worship like they have everything. And, and as they begin to worship and the music begin to play, they begin to dance. And I'm not talking about dancing like what we call dancing in Pentecostal circles. We jump around and act spasmatic and we call that dancing. They, they, they literally dance. Kind of like Chaz was dancing up here a few weeks ago. They, they, they got the moves and they dance and they dance to the rhythm of the music and they twirl and they, and they grab one another and they dance. And, and I looked at Pastor Cato and I said, you know what? In the United States of America, we've given dancing to the devil. We, we've made it something that the world does when in reality the church ought to be moving to the unforced rhythms of grace. The only reason the enemy gets that stuff is because we give it to him. The worst thing that the church could ever do is to become disconnected from the world that we've been called to reach. That is the worst thing that we could ever do is become disconnected from the very people that we have been called to reach. And, and when the church becomes afraid and, and uh, when we become the, afraid that what's outside these walls is going to contaminate what is inside this, these walls, then that, at that moment we have forfeited our vision. 
And when we become intimidated by the culture that we live in, and we retreat behind the walls of our cult, of our churches for safety, all we're doing is empowering the forces of darkness. And Jesus plainly said that His kingdom is supposed to be like salt, like water, like light, and like leaven. It's supposed to be an expansive kingdom, not a shrinking kingdom. We're supposed to have a, an expanding kingdom. Salt left in a shaker is useless. Stale water becomes putrid. Light that is blocked turns into darkness. Yeast that's left in a container remains powerless. And a church that is contained and controlled is the most ineffective organism on the face of the earth. I keep wanting to ad lib here today, but I'm going to stick to the script. Because for whatever reason, y'all are nervous in here. And, and, I don't really understand, but I do realize, and I want you to realize here today, that the church is the only institution in the world. Listen to what I'm saying. The church is the only institution in the world that has a branch in every city and a representative in every neighborhood. But if you were to ask most that are in Christian churches, there is a fear in our world right now that we are somehow losing and not winning. That we're somehow losing and not winning. But Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 11 says, And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Do you understand that it was never the intent of God that the church that Jesus was sent here to establish would someday begin to resemble a prisoner of war camp waiting to be liberated? We're not waiting to be liberated. We have been liberated for a purpose. And and we have been purposed to be worshipped world changers and we've been equipped what how are we equipped larry you have a story to tell and when you start telling your story the kingdom of darkness has to retreat but when you keep your mouth shut the kingdom begins to shrink and that's not what this was about i believe that it's time that we take responsibility and begin to raise the standard i'm preaching to you this morning from this thought raising the standard Isaiah 59 and 19 says this, that uh, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Amen? What are you preaching to us today, Larry? I'm preaching to you that as your pastor today, I refuse to retreat from the messiness of the world. I refuse to retreat from the messiness of this world. Salt is of no value if it never gets close to what needs to be salted. And and according to what Jesus said when he was establishing his kingdom, our purpose and our reason for being here is to be salt. But too many of us in the church are living with an old covenant mentality. And the old covenant said that if you touched anything dead or if you touched anything unclean, whatever you touched, you became. If you touched something unholy, you became unholy. If you touched something unclean, you became unclean. But you do you know that under the new covenant, Jesus reversed the order? And I know that under the old system, Touching something unholy made you unholy. But Jesus said, in my kingdom, your purpose is to be salt. And salt is not changed by what it touches, but salt touches everything that it changes. Hello? I know under the old covenant, you couldn't touch unclean things because you became clean. But see, we need to get the understanding. Paul had the understanding when he wrote to the, to the women in Corinthians. This is what we need under the new covenant. Under the old covenant, if I touch something unclean, I became unclean. But under the new covenant, if I touch something unclean, it becomes clean. Because I am the salt. I am the salt. And that's what Paul was talking about when he said a, a, a woman who is married to an unbeliever, she can, she can sanctify her house. And her husband doesn't even realize that even though he's an unbeliever, because he's living with somebody who is a believer, his house has come under the blessing of the covenant that she's walking in. I refuse to be afraid of the messiness of this world because what I have is greater than what is in the world. We are the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. I can go into the mess of this world and change it and it not change me. Amen. So when we really begin to walk out the revelation that we as believers are salt, we're not intimidated by anything in this culture. 
Because we begin to understand that anything I touch, the thing I'm touching is being affected and not the other way around. But in order for salt to be effective, watch this. In order for salt to be effective, it has to have the gift of proximity. Hello? Hello? Salt has to have the gift of proximity. You can... You can... uh, you, you can scramble you some eggs, and you can set your eggs at one end of the table, and the salt shaker at the other end of the table, but your eggs aren't going to get any salt on them. Salt has to have the gift of proximity. Salt has to touch. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. But salt has to touch what it's trying to season. See, and the church has had the mindset that we can't, uh, we touch not, taste not, handle not. We don't want anything to do with the world because the world might contaminate us. But how in the world are we going to change the world if nobody's willing to get close enough to the world? You cannot feed hungry people if you're not willing to touch hungry people. Hey, I know they come to you dirty. I know they come to you smelly. I know they come to you not looking right all the time. But in order to touch their lives, salt has to be willing to touch the mess of this world. you got to be willing to get in contact with what it is you're wanting to change. But we'd rather sit in our little church houses. Hallelujah. See, somebody has got to be willing to touch the hurting and broken and confused and desperate of this world. And sitting in the comfort of our churches will never affect our world. Let me put you on notice here this morning. I don't know how well I'm doing, but I'm feeling all right. Hallelujah. Listen, I, I, uh, it would have been Monday night, about 10 o'clock your time. Here is when I got up in Uganda on Tuesday morning. So just put your mind on 10 p.m. Monday night. Everybody say 10 p.m. Monday night. 10 p.m. Monday night is when I got up. Um, 10 p.m. Monday night is when I got up. And about, I don't know, Rosanna, have to help me with my math here. My mind's a little foggy. And we, whatever time we got up, I don't know. We woke up at, let me say this, we woke up at 7 a.m. Uganda time. Now subtract eight hours from that. I think that's 10 o'clock p.m. 10 or 11 p.m. 10, 11 p.m. on your Monday night. I was getting up on Tuesday morning. And we, we spent all day packing, getting ready, going to the airport. Our flight left out at 8.40 p.m. Tuesday, Uganda time. And we were an hour late getting on the plane. Because I'm, I'm not... You can laugh at this if you want, or make this is what they tell us over there. Whatever time they tell you over there, you need to adjust your watch to African time. Because whatever they tell you, you add 20, 30 minutes to it. And most of the time, an hour. So the plane's supposed to take off at 840. We haven't even boarded at 840. And we get on, and we're at least an hour late getting out of Uganda. And we fly to Rwanda. And we land in Rwanda. And we pick up another load of people in Rwanda. And we're an hour late getting out of there. We're sitting in an exit row. And the, the flight attendant's sitting right in front of us. And she sits down and looks at us. And she says, we're running very late. And now we have a 10 hour and 45 minute flight ahead of us. In order for us to get to Brussels, Belgium. And, and we're, we're getting ready to take off. And Roseanne and I are thinking, maybe we can sleep on this flight because I got a little leg room maybe I can sleep and we get up in the air and we're sitting in the only section of the plane that the air conditioner doesn't work and for 10 hours and 45 minutes we sweat and I listen there was a couple times I was ready to hit Rosanna because she kept touching me and it was like it kept sticking to me and I was like get off of me And by now, we've been up a long time. And we land in Brussels, Belgium, and we have a three-hour layover. 
in Brussels, Belgium, and so we grab some coffee and something to eat, and then we get on a plane and we fly to Geneva, Switzerland. And we land in Geneva, Switzerland, and they tell us you got to go to this terminal. And it takes us 30 minutes to get to that terminal, and we only had an hour between flights. And when we got to that terminal, they said, now you got to clear immigration. And the line for immigration was about 400 people. And I'm just sitting there, and we cleared immigration, and we got on a bus, and we got on another plane. And we sat uh, on this plane, and we had an hour, and I, uh, I don't know what it was. No, from Geneva, we, had, we, had, we flew from Brussels to Geneva another hour. We flew from Geneva to Washington, D.C., which was another nine hours. And now that I'm not sitting in an exit row, I'm sitting in little cramped spaces. That's why the rows in this church have plenty of room. But I sat in this little cramped space, and I couldn't sleep, and we landed in Washington, D.C. at 11.45 in the morning, and we had a few hours layover there, so we got something to eat, and now it's Wednesday, and we got something to eat there, and we got on another plane, and we flew three hours home to Dallas. We land in Dallas at 8 o'clock in the evening, and by the time we got to our house, we've now been up solid for 48 hours. I slept for four hours. Got up, draw, drove to Lawton, Oklahoma, preached two nights, slept four hours in the two nights, got up and drove home yesterday morning, and I really don't even know where I'm at today. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that, amen. Amen. But why are, you telling all of, why are you telling us all of that? Because, listen, I, I, it, it would have been easy for me to have somebody else speak to you today. It would have been easy for me to have, have somebody else fill in today and for me to try to catch up on rest. But my heart has been so stirred over the last two weeks. And I just want to put you on notice this morning and tell you that the refuge is being raised up to touch the ugly and the broken and the messy things in our culture. And that we're, we're, we're being raised up to touch what nobody else wants to touch. There may not be another church in this county that wants to touch the people that we are touching. But I refuse to back up and I refuse to give up and I refuse to lay down. I believe we've got a call. We've got to raise the standard and tell the world that we are salt and light to the whole world. Hey, come on, give him praise in here today. Woo! Not only do I want to be salt, but I want to be light. Because when light comes in, light begins to expose things that are hiding. And there's an illumination that has taken place in our city because we are making a commitment to be salt and light. I believe that while I was gone this week, I, I heard the Lord speak to me. I tell you, I heard him. Whoa, let me just tell you this. I don't really care if I don't get another service in today or not. Let me tell you something, Randy. For those of you that think everywhere in Africa is hot, it's not. And where we were, the climate is like San Diego, California. 70s in the days and 50s and 60s at night. No air conditioning. So we slept with the windows open and a little oscillating fan, and we'd get cold at night. Listen to this. At night, it'd be 65, 67 degrees when we were having church, and the people there would come in their, in their uh, winter coats because they were freezing. They asked us, are you not cold? And we're like, this is like heaven to me. <laughs> and, and I'm going to tell you, 65 degrees, I still sweat down to my socks. But on Friday nights, twice a month, twice a month, Pastor Cato does, it, does this at his church on Friday nights. Twice a month, they have all-night prayer meeting. But all the churches in Uganda observe all-night prayer meetings on Friday nights. And the place that we stayed was very close to one of the largest churches in Uganda called Miracle Center. And Roseanne and I laid down on Friday night in our room. And our room faced the, the direction of their church. And we had the window open. And we laid there till about 4 o'clock in the morning, 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. We didn't sleep that night because as we laid there that night... The thunderous roar of people praying. I don't think you're hearing me. 
I'm talking about the thunderous roar of people praying. And they weren't at a whisperer's convention. Oh, Jesus, help us, Jesus, help us, Jesus, help us, Jesus. These were people who were crying out to God. And they were crying out to God. And you could hear it all over the city. You could hear the sound of the worship of the people of God going up. And then they would stop praying for a minute and they would start singing. Rosanna reached out and grabbed my hand. And she said, Larry, she said, I feel like angels are all around us right now. And you could just hear the sound of the praise that was going up. And as I laid there and listened to people and I thought about coming home and I thought about what our job and our responsibility is here. I believe the Lord gave me a prophetic anointing to stand here and tell you this morning that this house is being strategically positioned for the fulfillment of Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. And Isaiah 42, 6 and 7 says, I the Lord have called you to demonstrate my righteousness uh, and I will take you by the hand and guard you. I will give you to my people as a symbol of my covenant with them and you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind you will free the captives from prison releasing those who sit in dark dungeons we are meant to be salt and light that is what we're here for that's what we're here for listen to me you don't have to like me you don't have to like the way I lead you don't have to like the people I choose You can criticize, complain, and get lost in your own self-importance if that's what you choose to do. But I've spent too many years of my life playing church games and pandering to people whose only interest in the kingdom is self-interest. And from where I'm standing this morning, there is already more of life behind me than there is ahead of me. And so whatever time and strength that I have left, I'm going to use it to declare to those who want it and need it that God is not here to condemn you, but the reason that salt and light is here is to love you and transform you and bring you into the preferred future that God originally designed for your life. I am here to pull people out of darkness. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, we baptized over 20 people here on a Sunday morning. The house was overflowing with people. Not enough chairs. People were standing to see their friends and loved ones being baptized into Christ Jesus. The music was loud. It had a beat to it that you could move to. People were dancing. I don't know how many of you got the opportunity to see the young man with Down syndrome that stood up here and outdanced every single one of you. He didn't care that his name wasn't on the program. Y'all not talking to me today. He was dancing and worshiping and giving all that he had to the king. There was a festive feeling in the church. Testimonies of changed lives and people finding strength to forgive and let go of things that had haunted them for years and years. It was powerful. And yet two hours after we left this place, I got a message telling me that something's wrong with my church and there's not any love here anymore. And I better be careful because I'm about to lose people who don't like the direction that I'm going. And I looked at Rosanna two two hours after one of the greatest days that I've ever experienced in the kingdom of God. And I looked at Rosanna and I asked her, how in the world could you be in that atmosphere today and not sense the love and the power of God? And then while we were in Uganda, I believe I heard God speak to my spirit and he gave me the answer and the answer is because some of us have settled down when our mission was to go forth some of you need to rebirth your radical spirit you need to get re-fired up for the kingdom of God this is no time to sit and criticize and complain we are salt and light We're salt and we are light. You see, sometimes, sometimes when you've walked with God for a while, y'all doing okay? Sometimes when you've walked with God for a while and you think you've become mature, you're not near as radical as you once were for Jesus. You've become sanitized and safe. 
And that's why it makes you nervous when new people start showing up. And I'm not talking about transfers from other churches. I'm talking about like new people. Like people that don't know when they're supposed to stand up, sit down, shut up, be quiet. Hello? I'm talking about people who are raw and rough around the edges. I'm talking about people who get up in front of over 200 people on a Sunday morning and talk about being forgiven from dealing drugs that have ruined other people's lives. I'm talking about young ladies finding the strength to stand up in front of over 200 people and tell you that they've been forgiven from having abortions and being delivered from years of sexual abuse and finally finding freedom in one man named Jesus rather than in multiple men and women and relationships that only brought heart, hurt and heartache. That makes some of you nervous. Why does it make you nervous? Because those are the kind of testimonies that begin to shake our community. And when other people who are bound in the same situation begin to hear those testimonies, the hope begins to rise in their heart. And they start showing up around here. And before too long, those people begin to outnumber us. And some of us have been around nothing but church people for so long that we're, we're afraid to be around people who don't yet know God. I realize that everyone coming through the doors of the refuge doesn't necessarily know church protocol. They don't know when to stand, when to sit, when to speak, when to be quiet. They don't know their Bible books or what's appropriate to say or where. I was sitting in a church one time and a guy came in. He was an old Navy uh, officer in the Navy. Rough, man, rough. And he got to testify and he, God saved him, radically changed his life. Some of you are about to get offended, so. Radically saved his life and changed his life. And he was so rough. Every other word out of his mouth was a foul word. And he stood up to testify in the church that we were in. And he, he, he was so grateful, tears running down his face. And he said, man, God has changed my life so much. He said, I didn't really think my life could ever be changed. He said, I've been, I've been addicted to cigarettes for 30-something years. He said, but the other night when God came into my heart and life, he said, man, the moment he came into my heart and life, not only did he save my soul, but he brought deliverance. And he said, I want everybody in this church to know that I hadn't smoked a damn cigarette since then. <laughs> Some of us would have been... Come on! Sometimes the only way you know how to describe it, you, you're not new, you're, 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 you're not changed enough yet to know any different. And I know it makes some of you nervous. But the people that God are sending to us don't make me nervous. They may not know... Uh, what to do all the time. But let me tell you what they do know. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was bound, but now I've got freedom. That's what they know. That's what they know. For those of us who've been around a while, it becomes easier and easier to settle down and fit in and we become comfortable and we no longer have a desire to see our cities turned upside down. But I'm in the refuge this morning to declare to you that God's purpose for this house is that we never settle down. That we never fit in. That we never go along to get along. He's called us to demonstrate radical love, radical forgiveness, and radical grace so that we can experience radical miracles and radical deliverance. And if that's not what you want to see, to hear, or to be a part of, I have no argument with you. I just simply tell you that's who we have been called to be. And we will refuse to walk by those who are hurting, forgotten, and abandoned by life and not be moved by their circumstances. I'm tired of those who don't know Jesus having more passion than those of us who do know Jesus. Amen. 
A spirit of gratitude attracts God. A complaining spirit attracts the enemy. Come on. Hey, how many of you know you don't have to like everything, but you can keep it to yourself? Because how many of you know some? You cannot like something. And if you just kind of keep it to yourself, a few days from now, God can move on your heart. And you get over it. But if you go around telling everybody what you don't like, a few days from now, while you get over it, they're still mad about it. And a complaining, acute. Listen. If you find yourself accusing, the Bible says it is the enemy who's the accuser of the brethren. And if you find yourself accusing people and things, you're on the wrong team, my friend. You need to change your speech and get on the right team. Wow. I'm tired of people that don't know Jesus having bigger dreams for our world than those of us who do know Jesus. Why are we content to let people who don't know him be the ones who salt our world and salt our culture? I want to start salting my world. Larry, the only reason people are coming to the refuge is because they're curious about what they hear is happening around here. Well, let me ask you something. What's wrong with that? That's exactly what happened in the book of Acts. It was curiosity that brought the city to the upper room. But when they got there, Peter was able to give an explanation about the demonstration that was going on. And that's what the Texoma region needs is a church that's not afraid to create a curiosity and then be able to offer an explanation for the demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God. Come on, somebody. Oh, they're only curious. That's the only reason you're drawing people. Let them be curious. And then when they get here, we'll tell them. It's time to raise the standard. The book of Acts is a description of what the New Covenant Church ought to look like. Larry, it's 1030. I know what time it is. The book of Acts is a description of what the New Covenant Church ought to look like. And the New Covenant Church was not a perfect church. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, six chapters into the book of Acts, and they're already fighting. And you know why they were fighting? Because the old ladies in the church, the widows, were upset because they weren't getting their soup on time. How, how many of you know if you hang around church for any length of time, somebody's going to get upset about something? I used to allow that to really, really bother me. But a few years ago, the Lord gave me deliverance, and I realized that people are like 900-pound gorillas. And they're going to do and act and say how and what they want. And it's not my job to pastor a perfect church, but it is my job to raise the standard and tell you that you have a job, and it's not to be the church critic or the church complainer. The Great Commission was not just for me as a preacher. The Great Commission is for every believer. And if you're leading people to Jesus Christ, then you don't have time to worry about who's getting ahead of who. Or When's the last time you personally won somebody to Jesus? But Larry, I'm filled with the whole If you want to be used of God, you can't get what's this. I want to be used of God. Oh, use me, Jesus. Use me, Jesus. And then somebody comes to you. And you're like, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for what's going on in your house, your family, your children, your husband. Don't talk to me about that. I got my own issues. And yet you want to be used of God, and God keeps sending you opportunities. You can't get mad at people for coming to you if you're filled and they're empty. The whole purpose of you being filled was not so you could hoard what you've been filled with. He filled you so he could pour you out into them. So you got to stop being mad at them for coming to you. Ain't nobody hearing me today. Come on. So I, I, I'm closing. Come on, Leland. So what is the standard? Please. Sorry. Please. So what is the standard? What is the standard that we're trying to raise here at the refuge? The standard is to love, to forgive, and to give of your time, your talent, and your finances. Roseanne and I were amazed. We sat on the sidelines. For those of you that are coming in for 11 o'clock, just come on in and take a seat. We may not break. 
we were amazed as we sat on the sidelines. Sunday after I preached. And it came time for them to receive their offering. Now remember, most people there live on less than $70 a month. And there's not factory jobs. And you know how they make a living? Listen to this. Let me tell you. The, the beauty of it is, dude, that hair. I can see you now. You don't blend in anymore. You're just kind of sticking out there, man. I like that. Rocking it. I saw that hair and got me throwed off for a minute. I can't, I can't remember where I was. <laughs> hey. Listen. Uh, we, we sat there and these people, the way that they make their living, um, as you drive through the streets of Uganda, it's an amazing thing. Bananas just growing everywhere. Pineapple growing everywhere. Mangoes and passion fruit. And everything growing everywhere. So the people go out, they have jackfruit. I don't, has anybody ever heard of jackfruit? No, you haven't. Just kidding with you. We've never heard of jackfruit. Jackfruit grows on trees, but it looks like watermelon. It's, it gets about that big. And then you peel it and you open it up and it's got, it, it tastes like candy. And you know that Heidi and Mike, they have a son named Jack. And he started eating that jackfruit and he's a little hyper. And he started eating that jackfruit and he got real wound up. And Jack looked at his mom and dad. He said, I know what I'm doing when I grow up. And they said, what? And he said, I'm coming to Uganda. I'm going to make jackfruit smoothies and get me a woman. <laughs> and let me tell you, they have some of the most beautiful women that I've ever seen in my life. You, you ladies, y'all be so jealous. Their skin is so smooth. Just milk chocolatey smooth beautiful people but they go out and harvest all that fruit and they as you drive down the roads and you gonna the roadsides are just littered with stands people just have stands where they sell fruit they sell fabric because all the pretty african dresses you can't go and buy one of those dresses like we do we we were going to bring you all a bunch of dresses back but we didn't realize you have to have dimensions and they make them while you wait you can't just go buy them off the shelf. They take your measurements and they make them right there while you wait. Beautiful stuff. But that's how they make a living. There aren't factory jobs and all of that. People are very poor. The guys that own the motorcycles give rides and that's how they make money. But as it came time for offering on Sunday, let me tell you, in that church, in that church, right across the street from a dump, people with no lights, no water, They took up four offerings. They took up tithe and offering. They took up family assistance offering. They took up a building fund offering. And they took up a pastor's offering that he uses to help people out in the community. And could I tell you, this is the truth. I texted Pastor James yesterday and I said, I'm preparing a sermon for tomorrow. I want, I want to ask you a personal question. Can you tell me how much money came into your church last Sunday? In two services here last Sunday, in two services, we had less than $1,200 that came in in two services. Those poor people gave more last Sunday. than we gave here last Sunday. What are you saying, Larry? I'm saying it's time to raise the standard. It's time to raise the standard. We, we want to be given to, but we got to learn how to give. And nobody's liking me today. I'm, I'm... We want to be forgiven, but we got to learn how to forgive. 
We want to be loved, but we got to learn how to love. We want people to do for us, but we're not willing to do for hardly anybody else. We're so self-absorbed. Come on, man. You know what Pastor James told me? I asked him, I said, what does your day look like? He said, my day looks like this. He said, I get to my church at 6 a.m. He said, I pray until 10 a.m. every morning. Four hours. Solid prayer. Then he and his wife walk through the streets of Nantete. Uganda and they pick up children who can't afford to go to school and they take them to school and they pray for their needs I said when do you have time for counseling people who are upset and mad and all that he said we don't do that here because everybody's needs are so demanding He said, if we don't operate in love, we'd never make it. Come on, somebody. The kingdom of God's got to be established and become a norm in Denison, in our city, in our community. So what's the standard, Larry? The standard is for every person who claims to belong to the refuge to get connected to this house and not live in isolation. Because isolation is the weapon of the enemy. Connection is where supply comes from. And it's hard to get what you need when you're not connected. I close with this today. One closing. Because it's bad when you go to Uganda and the pastor there makes fun of how many times you close. He said, Pastor Larry, you closed five times tonight. One closing as you stand with me today. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Just listen as I read to you, New Living Translation. What's the standard, Larry? Here's the standard for the refuge. We're raising the standard. That you would no longer be immature like children. That you would not be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. That you would not be influenced when people try to trick you with lies so clever that they sound like truth. Instead, that we will speak the truth in love. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as those who don't know God, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life that God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you've learned about Jesus. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God. Truly righteous and holy. Stop telling lies. Tell your neighbor the truth. For we're all part of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. For anger gives foothold to the devil. If you were a thief, stop stealing. Use your hands for good work. And then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement and not a discouragement to those who hear them. Don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you'll be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior instead be kind to each other tender hearted forgiving one another 
just as God through Christ has forgiven you. I don't know about you today, but I'm ready for the standard to be raised. 